cool things about being in a small bookstore because you can really um, spend a lot of time with individual customers and you can like find them a book that they'll really, really love. I especially love doing recommendations with kids. I just think it's like the sweetest thing when like this like little girl will come up to me and be like, you know, what, I don't know, um, have you got like this book in stock? And I'm like, yeah, babe, I got you, <laughs> like I'll sort you out. You know, one of my favorite moments is when you, you know you found like the perfect book for someone, they're really gonna love it. That's the good version of sort of small local bookstores. I started in 2017 and the people who I thought I would be working with all left within the space of a month. And I thought that was really strange at the time. Didn't clock that maybe that was a red flag for a toxic workplace culture. Issues with workplace bullying and harassment. Um, seeing my colleagues in a lot of pain. The store had a really high turnover um, and had had that high turnover for a number of years since I had started. I mean, you never want to start a job and immediately hear that there's bullying and harassment in the workplace. Like, that's maybe one of the scariest things that can happen. You would do mm. whatever you were told to do because yeah. you didn't want to get in trouble, you didn't want to get reprimanded. A favouritism that was, like, inexplicable that would shift and change all the time that would have a, a direct impact on how many shifts you got that week. I think everybody genuinely just wanted to um, kind of keep a low profile. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it was a hostile working environment. People come in and expect you to know everything about um, new releases, but also like classics and every sort of single stuff. Book. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. Like what you would reasonably expect a, a bookseller to be doing. On a retail worker. A retail. Be doing. <laughs> yeah, a retail worker to be doing on their day to day. Um, like being asked to run, you know, a writing competition, uh, being asked to do all the social media posting um, and do that on your day off. A lot of things that sometimes were needing to be performed outside of work hours or um, some people felt went over and above um, what was included in the award level we were, we were being paid. There was this idea to just have like a generic chat group for the social media where people would just post on it saying this needs to go up today and it was posted so that it was on facebook so everyone could just see on their day off like this needs to go up and there was an implicit expectation that someone even on their day off would be able to just open up the app you know write out a caption put it up um you know curate this thing managers had left we were all we were all getting paid at retail one like the entire time but obviously once management left that meant that we had to take on management responsibility um you know we were working events like all this sort of stuff a lot of people just assume the the goodwill of your employer right but you know time and time and time <laughs> yeah. again you look everywhere yeah. and it's just like wage theft is rampant my work at better ed actually started with doing a podcast um and getting paid at like level one retail, which sort of the retail award doesn't really begin to cover the kinds of work that making a podcast involves. When you, like when we were looking at the award, it was like, oh yeah, we are getting absolutely rotted. We were doing jobs that um, we felt made us uh, like deserving of at least retail level three pay. One of the, one of the key issues was the extremely high staff turnover. Um, I remember when I started in, in 2017, um, I, I had been a customer at the shop for quite a while and was like friends with a bunch of the, um, the booksellers there at the time. Shortly after I joined, um, almost, all of the, almost all of the floor staff left uh, in the space of like, one or two months. And I had people warn me about the workplace culture. I thought that it was like concerning, but then kind of pushed it to the back of my mind. And it was only when we started unionizing in 2020 that I realized that, that, that this is kind of cycle in that workplace. So I sent an email to uh, a representative from Rafu Lucas um, in late August, outlined uh, what I thought had been happening at the workplace and asked if I could set up a meeting. Um, he replied and uh, very quickly and was like, absolutely, more than happy to have a chat. What I remember most vividly is this sense of like 
um, the blinders coming off, right? It's like, I feel like there's a sense of being gaslit by your management, by your workplace for so long that suddenly when you're stating your issues to someone uh, and just kind of laying it out and having someone respond to you, oh, that sounds really messed up. Like that sound, that does not sound normal at all. It was a relief. It was a huge relief. When people first started joining the union, I think a lot of the conversations that were happening about unionising in those early days were happening on the shop floor, just quietly, um, in quiet moments. I guess the end of 2020, in the, in the second half of 2020, and it felt very exciting to me. It... Galvanising people into a sense of solidarity with one another by showing them what was possible, right? Something was going to come of it um, and for the better, and it felt like this very real um, opportunity for change. This could actually get off the ground, right? I remember learning a whole new vocabulary for a start. <laughs> um, even just like what what are claims, what kinds of things can we ask for in an agreement and what should we ask for, what do we prioritise, all that kind of thing. Having people join the union in a very real way and having like so many people like so open to it and so ready to to join and like take up some sort of fight um, with each other was like so exciting. I think my first union meeting, which was on Zoom by that point, I had a whole notebook of new words because <laughs> I didn't think I'd remember um, what everything meant. Better Red Than Dead had a meeting with previous worker at Better Red Than Dead who had been there for so long. She was the kid's buyer. Fantastic. Um, fantastic. Great at her job. And she had sort of come and joined the union later than all of the floor staff, as she like was not a floor staff member, um, and was yeah so staunch. And I remember at some point, um, better read than dead, going to her and saying like talking to her about the union, and she I don't know if she outright said that she was in the union or if they outright asked her, mm -hmm. but I think. No, I think they asked her if she was in the union and then she implied that she was by saying, like, I think a lot more people than you're aware of are in the union. And that was just like so staunch. And I felt think, so yeah, good. That felt great. This is what we could do. Yeah. Like, are you, do you want to, do you want to do this? It was like this sense that it was almost like this war of attrition and we were winning because we had the numbers. It was not an under the table thing we were doing, it was legitimate. We have a right to unionize, mm. this is all above board. Mm. And so it was really actually exciting for me to think, well, we're strategizing, we're doing everything we have to do. And when we have this moment of rupture, we'll be ready. And it's, you can't say no to us because it's our fucking legal right. When we first approached Better Red for Dead and asked them to bargain, they initially agreed, but then later on changed their mind. Um, which meant that in order for us to sit down at the bargaining table, we realised we were going to have to um, collect a petition of the majority of workers in the store and have them appoint Rafu as the bargaining representative in order to force Better Than Dead to meet with us just to start the bargaining process. I did feel nervous, but I also felt comforted because it was a collective yeah. move. If we could have just sat down together with less conflict from the get-go and actually tried to work together. Um, yeah, to... I was stoked actually mm. that they agreed initially. I was like, great, we can all sit down together. It can be a really good and respectful conversation and everyone can know that everyone has the, the business at heart, really, like the best interests of the workers and the business together. When Better Than Dead agreed to bargain and then reneged on that agreement um, a couple of days later, I think it was like after the weekend, that felt so aggravating. Um, and that, yeah, because that marked the start of this behavior where they would sort of agree to something and then renege on that agreement. Um, we saw that later when they, you know, agreed, I think multiple times to the actual enterprise agreement and then reneged. Um, so that in and of itself was so frustrating um, because we thought it was going to be this somewhat straightforward thing. And then when they went back on that, that was a really like rude shock. I don't know, I kind of really hoped that it would be amicable. Um, 
and then it suddenly wasn't anymore, and that was mm -hmm. that was surprising and hard, actually. We were trying to reach an agreement that would work for workers, but of course would also work for the business. And the only way to do that would be to, um, through communication at bargaining meetings, to reach some kind of compromise. Um, and I feel like when they were unwilling to bargain again and again, it forced us into this, this position. I get this email that's popped into my inbox, and it's from Better Red Management and it's actually no, it's not from Better Red Management, it's from a lawyer that I've never heard of. It's basically saying that my sharing of the post was defamatory and that if I don't take it down immediately, um, I could yet be threatened with jail time, um, would have to pay a huge fine. I guess that kind of gave me a bit of a moral energy as well to say. It really helped to distinguish any of the um, internalised guilt about, oh, but it's a the local bookstore, like I don't want to be the person that makes life difficult for a, like a small business. That defamation threat broke all of those internalized guilt feelings because I was like, whoa, it's not about it's not about that anymore. Actually, this is I'm not the bad guy here. <laughs> <laughs> After the MSD, when people started receiving letters. Um, saying that their petition was going to be made redundant. Um, that was quite demoralising. I think that actually did change the, the, the level of anxiety and the kind of questions that um, we were having on the shop floor. It was a stressful thing for those employees, but it was also stressful for all of us. It really shifted our focus a little. Um, in terms job of security. Job security became kind of the, um, one of the most important parts of our campaign and became a really cool claim. Being in lockdown and just being at home all the time, we'd have these weekly Zoom meetings. Um, it was hard not to be able to meet in person, but it was also like this interesting um, way of connecting through the lockdown. Those weekly meetings became like, sometimes they were hours and hours long. We would be, it was almost like a, um, everyone's social connection as well as the union meeting and it had this interesting way of really bringing us together in a different way. I said it was just like this like group therapy session <laughs> where we were just talking about oh yeah management yelled at me today. Yeah. Uh, management didn't actually say a word to me today they just ignored me it was really nice <laughs> like yeah. it was just quite serious because we were dealing with um redundancies pre-EBA so you know, there weren't those protections in place. It really mattered to us that we were stronger together and that we couldn't be individually targeted. When the idea was formed to, to do the um, May One kind of community forum online because that meant that our story and what was happening could get out to the community. And it was the first time that we really um, went public with the campaign and have other people from outside of our small group who would be meeting every week. Having people like show that support um, was amazing and I remember that the Zoom sort of only had a certain amount of people allowed within the, mm. the Zoom and then it was like people could watch it on, on the live stream as well and I remember like within the first um, 10 minutes like it maxed out like and that was such an amazing feeling. One of the first times that we realised on that scale, what we were doing was so much bigger than our workplace. Mm. Because these are people from other unions, from other workplaces with their struggles, and because of their values, they cared about what we were doing because it meant better things for everyone. Mm. And I think the more we went on, the more we realised how much what we were doing ramified more broadly than just our, our little shop. Uh, the MUA Sydney branch will be alongside RAFWU and your rank and file all the way through these these battles. And it takes courage, what you workers have done. Real courage. Not None of, none of this uh, rubbish. When you've got nothing, you know, you're in precarious work, you know, um, you're a casual. The MUA is here alongside you and our members um, until that victory uh, is delivered. It was, it was really special to have like-minded people tell us like actually we're doing a good thing because mm -hmm. a lot of I think you mentioned bef before um, the way that things were kind of framed in the workplace was that we were trying to ruin the business or 
I don't know that it was some kind of attack when really at its core, like it was always to, to make things better for everyone and to have a whole forum of people saying like, yes, this is a good thing to do and it's, it's good that you're doing this and we're proud of you. Um, just really meant a lot at that time. Retail workers haven't gone out, as far as I can remember, a group of retail workers going out on a protected action or going on strike tonight as well. The CFMEU Construction Division in New South Wales will fully support all workers, not just at this bookshop, but in the retail sector that go out and put their hand up to take on the company they work for to get their rights. And I've got to say, I look forward to throwing our support behind all of the workers in this bookstore and backing in to the hilt. It's heartening to actually see this in, in that sector. Cheers, comrade, and I look forward to the 20,000 construction workers marching down King Street with 10,000 yep. university students as well, um, yep. along with maritime workers and as broad a section of the working class as we can get. And it really meant a lot to us um, and kind of gave us that energy that we needed to keep going. It was really mm. great. Yeah, like I felt like that that real sense of solidarity yeah. like yeah. was so real in that moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. That we are a part of a a broader literary ecosystem and there are also movements to unionize in publishing and in um, libraries, library workers and publishing workers. Within this May 1 meeting, Anwen Crawford um, basically like launched the author's open letter. Here this evening, it's a great honor to be here and I'm so excited to see nearly a hundred people here. And um, really it's my uh, honor this evening to be able to publicly launch an open letter that went up today um, at Overland Journal, published by our great comrades at Overland, um, which has been written on behalf of uh, Australian authors, of which I'm one, um, in support and in solidarity with the workers at Better Red Than Dead Industries. No matter where we work or what we do, everyone deserves to live comfortably and share in the immense wealth of our society. Solidarity, your fight is our fight. So I'll just read out the last little part of this letter that launched today. The union campaign at Better Red Than Dead is a litmus test for Australian literature and for retail working conditions across the continent. The publishing industry, of which book selling is one part, likes to congratulate itself on its social progressivism. But this means nothing without material conditions for workers in the industry that grant those workers job security and dignity of life. A bookshop like Better Red can no longer hide behind the veneer of being a progressive employer while they suppress their workers organizing for a fair workplace, nor can we as authors stand aside and let them. We stand with each other. Everyone is in this for everyone else. Thanks, everyone. It was like hundreds and yeah, hundreds, hundreds of signatures. And it was, yeah, that feeling was amazing. Like it was, it was amazing not only getting like the support of, of unions and unionists um, who had, you know, had been like established in, in left-wing move movements, but yeah, getting the support of, of authors um, who were like well-known for their work was huge. Like I remember, yeah, we got like Clementine Ford, we got like Krista Siolkis. Like people who you've been reading for years um, and then suddenly to see them like supporting like such a, like a campaign um, of like a local independent shop was really overwhelming. We yeah, got Raven Ma. Leilani, like we got, that yeah, was huge, that was just massive. like I've read her book, what she's I doing, know, signing I know. this. For it's like, she's like an American author, yeah. like it was so... It wasn't just Australian authors, yeah. like it broke out into, that gave us all a real kind of just pep and energy and kind of figure to keep going. It was yeah. also really cool when we got, um, support from the library, from it was Geelong Library. Yeah, yeah just to great. see that yeah. people in another state had yeah. heard about what was going on for us yeah. and cared. The yeah. other thing that was launched at the at the forum was a welfare fund for all of us. Part of the purpose of that was also to educate people and also ask people to donate if they were able to. To let people support us um, while we're taking industrial action um, and 
um, to make up for some of those lost wages. Yeah. I was so I'm scared. Yeah. It's like if I get locked out, which happened, mm. but only lasted for like 24 hours. Anyway, mm. it's like, I, how am I going to be able to like live my life? I remember Josh saying, we don't want you guys living on instant noodles. And I was just like, no, but that's just what's going to have to happen, Josh. Yeah. Like it really... We received a lot more money than I was expecting for that. I thought maybe we'd make a few hundred dollars or a thousand dollars or something maybe like, like that. Maybe like a gift card. I think there was already this fear because it was, industrial action was a new experience for us, but it was a new experience for the sector. Like it hadn't mm. like happened like 50 years or something, except for I think it was meat. It was meat workers at Coles. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it was this huge undertaking and it was scary because it, you know, just we didn't know what was going to happen. It was really moving that people were just so willing to financially back us. Like, mm. the solidarity was incredible. Seeing um, the Choft campaign, so essentially like a crowd funding for our strike levy or fund, um, was, yeah, definitely super heartening. Um, it sort of gave us the confidence to, you know, be prepared to take indefinite in industrial action so that we could um, achieve our desired uh, uh, enterprise agreement, which was used. And, and just also, I think, as a sign of solidarity when mm. um, people couldn't show up in person. Like, not burning out. <laughs> but I was so proud. Like, I was proud of them. I was proud of us. I was excited and silly. And so actually, yeah, it was an injection of a new type of energy that wasn't just fury. It was also pleasure and excitement and, I think, pride as well. I was mm. proud of... I was just proud to be in the right place at the right time to be able to be involved, really. So to have that fund behind us really, really helped us actually implement our industrial action. Truly gave us the confidence and the freedom and just the ability to be able to take industrial action when the time came and have a little bit of a safety blanket and just couldn't believe how, how generous people were and how ready they were to, to be with us all the way. And it was, it was really great. I remember feeling so supported mm. because so much of our struggle had been silent because we were kind of a bit apprehensive to speak publicly about it and also because of lockdown. To see all the names, um, all the people who wanted to support us in whatever way they could, I, that was so powerful. Protected Industrial Action is basically um, the removal of some sort of work. It's really hard to go into your job that you care about um, and want to do a good job at and say, actually, no, I'm not going to be performing these tasks. Uh, included things like stopping doing web orders, um, stopping doing uh, the window displays. And returns. Returns. Stuff like that. Work. We would still go to work and do our duties, but there'd be some things that we wouldn't do that would like effectively show the employer that like without our labor, their business is worthless. Before we, um, we, you know, we gave notice um, to management that we were going to be participating in industrial action. Um, management came up to each of us individually um, and asked if we were going to be participating in the industrial action. And then everyone said yes. Um, and then we were given these letters um, that, you know, had our name on them and just said, if you do not um, agree to participate in your work duties, you will be locked out. There was no wracking. There was no wracking. There was a huge change when we implemented industrial action, like a real, like, palpable change in their behaviour. They, they added, I mean, attitudes towards us, but also just the attitude towards bargaining in general. We noticed a, a, a marked difference after we undertook industrial action. Returns were, they, they sound kind of boring, boring, but actually at that point in time in the business, they were a very important thing because in lockdown, um, basically if when there's books that haven't been sold, we can return them to the publisher and get a, a bunch of money back, <laughs> right? Um, in order to buy new stock. So it's kind of, it was, it is a really pivotal part of the cash flow for the business. Um, and web orders were the only way that we were um, receiving orders basically. And at some point like there was there were these book packs that were like wrapped up with ribbon that were in the window and like this was after they'd done the, the display and like one of them was just sort of like walking out the door and like noticed one was a bit loose 
and so it sort of like put it on the front counter and was like, oh, can you like just fix this? I'm just going to go do this other thing. And I was like, oh, sure. And then Maddie pointed out that, that because it was part of the like window display, it was, you know, like we, we were taking industrial action, so we could not do that. We were engaging in the first three types of um, the partial work bans. Um, like we said, they were kind of our testing the waters, getting used to saying no to doing things because of industrial action. Um, and then after a, a few days of that, we, we were like, okay, nothing's changed really on the bargaining table. It's time to step it up. Before we implemented industrial action, there was it was just like a series of events where management were constantly, like we got defamation letters, we got, you know, like them refusing to bargain and then coming to the bargaining table then saying they weren't ever going to happen again. Like there was like this real sense of them having all the power. The notice period before we took the industrial action, we were instructed to um, train new staff who'd just been hired or who were going to be hired for the period of industrial action on how to do these tasks to be training new workers to do these tasks that we were um, going to be refusing to perform felt really conflicting because um, we can't refuse uh, um, a direction from our employer um, and also we were having to train staff who were going to be directly undercutting the action we were taking. Um, yeah, it's challenging taking on the power that I actually have. I'm demonstrating to myself that I've got it, I'm demonstrating to you that I've got it, and suddenly we're in a very different workplace now. It was incredibly empowering to feel the tangible effects of us doing stoppages and them feeling the consequences. We all really, you know, came to the realisation of how, how important our labour is. The day before that it was due to be instated, we received the stand down letters as a kind of last ditch effort from the employer to get us to change our mind. So we implemented our bans on web orders and returns um, and really quickly um, Better Ed and then came to the bargaining table. We had a bargaining meeting that was really productive. All of a sudden we were able to find agreement on almost all of the issues that were important to us. Um, better than dead, um, offered, um, all of these things. We had a meeting that night, um, Josh explained what had been offered to us. We discussed it at length. There were a couple of issues that were outstanding that we believed were important enough that we wanted to make sure, um, they were agreed to before we accepted this offer. Um, Josh called our employer late at night um, and a few minutes later came back to the Zoom room and said, yeah, we've got a deal, that's all agreed to. Um, it was big celebratory energy. Everyone was very excited and proud of what we've been able to achieve. Um, yeah. They had a brief conversation and management agreed in principle to the agreement. We're all like waiting with pages. Yes, yeah, so we're just kind of like, oh, what's going yeah. on? Um, Josh comes back and it's like, it's quite late. No, it was like kind of 9 pm or something. Um, I, I mean, not that late. Like, everyone was awake at the time. <laughs> After pestering management saying, hi, like, why are you stalling? What's going on? Um, they reneged the agreement uh, and they decided that there are a number of very central claims that they no longer um, no longer agreed to. And yeah, I remember feeling at the time like, wow, that it was just such a like so annoying. Like it was so mm -hmm. typical. Yeah. So like, surely we it would we wouldn't get it that easy. Like it was yeah. just so typical of management's mm -hmm. behaviour throughout the whole process. But yeah, it was really like we sort of had to like the feeling that we just had to go through this all again and like yeah. Yeah, it was so like, oh god, like the the, fear, the the desire to just like throw in the towel. Yeah, it was, was it was hard. Like we yeah. were incredibly demoralized. We yeah. just gone through this incredibly difficult ordeal, and suddenly we had to do it all again. But yeah. that didn't, you know, 
yeah. it didn't stop us from doing it but it was it was hard to yeah. um kind of go okay we need to regroup and get this done properly yeah and the fact that everyone kept doing it even though it sucked and was hard at times mm. was really powerful the customers are, are getting onto the social media of the store and saying why is this still going it's been going for so long but we held a rally we gathered not directly in front of the store but on the footpath close by in recent weeks uh through the employer's lawyers it's gone clear that they are no longer holding to their agreed position. And we had some people speaking, ex-employees who spoke about their experience and explained to the broader public why we were doing what we were doing. An ex-colleague, Zach, and then Emma, who I believe was still mm -hmm. employed at that time, spoke. My name's Emma and I've worked at Better Red Than Dead for three and a half years Woo! and I've been part of Rapwick since August 2020, when our campaign started. Thank you. <laughs> the workers at Better Red and Dead have been organizing and fighting to secure fair wages and fair treatment through an enterprise bargaining agreement. And we'll keep fighting, keep getting louder, and getting stronger until we get it. We workers fought for this agreement fairly and with integrity, and Better Red Than Dead have decided to rescind on claims they previously agreed to. Claims to be negotiated on. I was really scared that no one was going to show up. <laughs> Sending myself, other workers, and Rapu cease and desist letters from their team of lawyers. Industrial action was our only option. All of us were asked by Better Ed if we were participating in industrial action, and every single one of us said yes. Yeah. Now, 15 weeks later, Better Ed and Dead has walked back on claims they agreed to, including parental leave, Sunday penalty rates, and junior rates. Yeah. We have always been willing to negotiate, but this is completely outrageous, and we will not be conceding on these fronts. We're going to get louder and stronger, and we're absolutely united in this fight to better our workplace, to better this industry, to better conditions for booksellers and all retail staff in this country. It was powerful. It was the first time as well out of lockdown that we were able to gather in person um, and have a community forum. And we have to see you at Camtown Park next Friday. A number of community members, customers, friends showed up to that to that rally. And I've been going to Better Red Dead for years, um, and I'm basically here to support the workers in their in their fight. There's small businesses exploiting workers. I think that that is actually the business model that constitutes these kinds of businesses around the country, and it's completely outrageous and unacceptable and I don't think any of us should put up with it. What is exceptional about today is that there's a group of people who are prepared to actually together take some kind of action and refuse to be treated uh, like second class citizens. And then we did another march and that march was sick as well um, because there were way more people. <laughs> from the business's perspective as well as like now's the time for them to kind of recoup some of their 
losses, and so they were on the clock um, in a way that maybe we weren't as well. Like we were just as resolved, but suddenly they were on the clock in a different way. Yeah. Um, in book selling, Christmas is the period where true. you make all of your money for the year. The, all of these orders were, were streaming in, and um, and no one was able to, to fulfill them. They ended up, they had to um, close the website, close the orders section of the website. And once we were satisfied that they were not, that they were actually serious this time, then we were able to reach another in principle agreement and start that more bureaucratic process of getting it through the Fair Work Commission again. Very real public pressure, I think, um, coupled with our industrial action, just meant that they yeah. sort of had very, very little choice um, but to yeah. concede to our demands. All workers to be classified at least at retail employee level three following probationary periods. Full restoration of 100% penalty for work on Sunday. Abolition of junior rates following probationary periods. Converted part-time workers to be paid a base rate of $1 per hour more than the award minimum with penalty and other rates on top suite of health and safety clauses, policies and rights detailed in the agreement. 20 days paid domestic violence leave for those experiencing or supporting those experiencing domestic and family violence. 26 weeks paid parental leave and a number of other important outcomes. <laughs> they walked further and further into realising that they didn't actually have the power in the situation. Fucking satisfying. Yeah, it felt really good. It felt so good. Like, it was just this, like, it was this release. Uh, like, like, this weight had been taken off our shoulders. When we won the agreement, I guess that happened twice. We, it, we thought that happened twice. Yeah. <laughs> Both times we thought it was for real. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, just just to see that, that we'd done it was the best. I felt really proud to have achieved one of the only union agreements in the retail sector. Um, I, I hope it sets a precedent for other retail workers um, to know that they can also fight for better conditions in their workplaces. And the public pressure was huge. So there was like a bunch of, you know, members of the community who were at this rally who saw this rally um, and uh, like, you know, the, the management was aware of this support. Um, and also, yeah, this like, the fact that the media picked up on it. So mm -hmm. the Sydney Morning Herald wrote about the Guardian, rally. I think. The Guardian, yeah, had written previously about it. Um, like it was in all the inner west little newspapers. It feels great to be still working in this, in this job and know that we have these protections in place now. Really significant uh, for the bookshop industry. Um, and its reverberations are uh, still being felt. Like you look at what's happening at readings, you look at people organising at dinners, you look at people organising in like different bookshops all around the country, and like there's a there's a real a real sense from booksellers everywhere that like actually yeah we we deserve better conditions and we can fight for them. Um, it's been so inspiring to so many people, yeah. um, and that's like the biggest. It has. I reckon it's like <laughs> it's been like such a kind of um, and like and not yeah like not just booksellers but people in other industries as well, right? It's like um, to see that there's actually like there there is real power and people taking control of you know of their labor and wanting to you know make things better as possible to do that even in a small business. The campaign was yeah hugely important for not only the bookstore industry but like broader retail. I think that we can already see the effects of this campaign on, you know, the readings campaign, like showing that it can be done. It can be done in a sector that is like overwhelmingly young people um, who are employed in casual positions. Um, it can be done, um, you know, like in, in small to medium sized businesses. Um, it doesn't have to be these massive chains. One thing that stands out is something that I've learned is I feel like I've um, I think that thickened my understanding of what change can look like in the world. So it can be done and it is possible and yeah. people are already doing it. And I think that was like one of our things that we really hoped for in getting the EBA mm -hmm. was that it would set a precedent yeah. um, for other workers to get the same thing and hopefully better. The main reason that we won this in the end is because we didn't fucking stop. You know, coming in, I joined when I was 17. I've learned so much about unions 
So that, that was huge. Um, like I... Do you feel different from when you... Oh, like, yeah. I, I feel... How did it change you? I, I think it really helped. Like, I found it to be an incredibly empowering experience. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm the youngest of my colleagues. I was kind of like, oh, I don't know, like, there are so many other people who are better than me and who can provide and offer more. It's been huge for me um, and also really helped kind of shape my values and mm. that kind of thing. Yeah. I think seeing like you change and I think become so invested and I think seeing, you know, everyone else in the bookstore mm-hmm. has been, yeah, great um, and like really inspiring. I think that's, that is probably like one of the biggest lessons I've taken out of it that is like, yeah, just sort of the power of solidarity. I know oh, it's a yeah. cliche, but it is so real. Like this is why, you know, you can see how movements are made. I learned a lot of things. I learned a lot about, um, about the power of workers and the power that workers do have in a workplace when and if they're able to come together. Um, in a workplace like many retail workplaces, the workers are what make the workplace run. The, the workplace is nothing without the people who know the ins and outs of that job um and so it's really powerful to to realize that that even though working in a job there's such a hierarchy and power disparity between you and your employer um you do have power to make changes i think the best moment of the campaign for me was getting to stand down with her and not being ashamed or afraid knowing that this is a gamble from them that I know isn't going to pay off. Yeah, I always think back to like something you said at one of the rallies, which is like, you know, there's like power and um, power in the union and power in like our, you know, in solidarity, right? Um, that we can come together and like, um, you know, take control of our futures and be able to build better workplaces. Um, I think before that point. You know, my expectation was that if I, like, um, if there was a, a problem at a workplace, like, the solution is to, um, is just to leave and you just kind of continually move on and on and on and try and find, like, a greener pasture. But that actually have the capacity to, like, build something better here and now. Um, and that was, I think, the, yeah, my main takeaway from the whole thing is that, like, we can, we can change our circumstances right here, right now. Mm-hmm.